Hey, today we're going to talk about a problem that affects as many as 93 million Americans over the age of 18, including the two of us. Having a brother or a sister you just can't stand. <laughs> like most things in life, sibling relationships are sometimes out of balance. What can you do to restore balance and get love and comfort from someone who's currently a pain in the butt? All right, let's start with a few questions. Do you have siblings? Raise your hand if you have a brother or sister. Wow. Now keep your hands up if that brother or sister is a pain in your butt. Now don't be ashamed to admit it. They're thinking the same thing about you. <laughs> a lot of pain out there. A lot of pain. So if you're an only child, you're feeling pretty good right now. For the rest of you, one final question. You're likely all successful in your professional lives, which means you're used to getting along with all kinds of different people, including CEOs. And as you've probably read, or maybe even experienced, compared to the general population, a CEO is four times more likely to be a psychopath. Not me, though, right? Now, if you could get along <laughs> with a psychopath, can't you get along with your brother or sister? To answer that question for ourselves, we're conducting an experiment in forgiveness, and we're calling it Let It Go. We love the m message in the movie Frozen. To love in the present, you must live in the present. For you scientists out there who like your Walt Disney sprinkled with a little Stephen Hawking, the hypothesis we're testing is that you could transform a dysfunctional relationship into a functional one by letting go of the past. Like all experiments, ours may fail. It's been going on just about a year now, and another 14 minutes and one second. We'll see what happens when the countdown clock strikes zero. In the meantime, here's how our experiment began. With the near coming up, many of you are probably thinking about your near's resolutions. What can you do to change your life to make it even better? For me, my New Year's resolutions always begin with looking at the past year and asking myself, what's missing? What do I need to add back into my life to make it more whole? What's out of balance? It's like going to a chiropractor and making an adjustment only to your life. Like one year, I wasn't listening to my favorite tunes. Another year, I just wanted to read a whole book. But last January, I had other things on my mind. My father-in-law, Ed, was dying. It was a very tragic and sad time, but it was also a very meaningful one because death for me has always put life in perspective. When I was a young girl, on Friday nights, I would turn out the lights in my bedroom and lay out a bunch of votive candles on the floor and read my favorite section of the newspaper, the obituaries. <laughs> I know that sounds creepy, but actually it was very life-affirming. I would study those stories, the beginnings, the middles, and the ends. And I would always wonder if they made the right choices when they still had the time. So seeing my father-in-law Ed in his final days, I was inspired to ask myself, have I made the right choices? What's missing for me? Who do I want at my deathbed? The answer was obvious, my sister. She would know exactly what to do in that situation. Unfortunately, having her at my deathbed is not likely when she's not even in my life. For the last 20 years, we've lived 45 minutes apart over the Golden Gate Bridge, and we've been together alone three times. For good reasons, mainly, that when I do see her, she brings up our past how I dumped her when we were teenagers for boys in school, and later after college for my career, how I never had the time, which I know, I was there, I just don't need to be reminded again and again and again. She's the opposite of those sisters in Frozen. She can't let it go. Actually, I can let it go. I just like to talk about things until there's mutual understanding and resolution, which when your sister doesn't have the time, may take 20 years and counting. Yeah, she can't let it go, so I had to let her go. <laughs> Even my therapist agreed, this is not healthy. But seeing my father-in-law dying, I actually feel sick to my stomach, and I know I need my sister. When at that very moment, while I'm holding Ed's hand, she sends me a text message for the first time in her life. She's never sent me a text before because it's impersonal, just like calling from my car is impersonal. She has these crazy rules around connecting, which is another reason we disconnected. But here she's reaching out. Maybe it's a sign she wants to put the past behind her. It's actually not a sign. It's just good manners to want to reach out and ask your sister how she's feeling when her father-in-law is dying, right? Now, Leslie and I were incredibly close growing up. We shared a bed during our parents' divorce under the covers as their marriage exploded on the other side of our bedroom wall. As teenagers, we held hands. We were so affectionate, the high school librarian thought we were lesbians. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Leslie was just an amazing nurturer. So when we grew up, I thought she'd be a stay-at-home mom. I, on the other hand, was going to have a career, like our mother did, because that's how you want our mother's approval. 
At least that's how I thought you want it. When Leslie went away to college, my mom cried. When I went away, she went to a TGTG party. Thank goodness they're gone. <laughs> so it wasn't until after I graduated college, while I was taking care of our 92-year-old grandmother during her last year of life, that I realized my true calling. I was a nurturer after all. So like one in five moms with a college degree, I chose to use my education to, en to enter the workforce at home. I chose to lean in to raising a family full time at a very high level. But no matter how many soccer games I coached, or Girl Scout meetings I led, or Sunday school classes I taught, I always had time for my sister. The problem was, she never had time for me. Well, that's because of her crazy rules around connecting. I can't call from my car. I can't call from my office. I have to call from my home to her home, which is her office. And you know, I'm working 70 hours a week. I'm trying to be a great CEO, a present mom, and a good wife. I just don't have time for much more. Well, it all came to a head over one of the deepest symbols of our family, the three Christmas wall hangings. Every year when we were kids, our mom would hang them up on the wall, and we would ring the bells as we walked by. Many Christmases later, I'm at Leslie's house, and I noticed the wall hangings, and I noticed the one I loved as a child. So I asked Leslie, may I please have that one, as I've asked her for the last 10 years. And I say no, as I've been telling her for the last 10 years, because they're a set, they belong together, and they belong to me. <laughs> Which is currently true, but I still want my wall hanging back. So I wait for Leslie to leave the room, and I appropriately steal it off of her wall, put it in my car, and drive it home. So I get in my car, drive over the bridge to her home to get it back. 90 minutes round trip, when she doesn't have time to have lunch with me. All right, so fourth quarter is just nutty for me. I'm traveling the whole month of November and most of December. That's why those wall hangings are so important to me. They connect me to my family tradition, and I look forward to that every year. Why don't you just tell me that instead of getting all CEO on me? Well, I am a CEO, and I'm tired, and I don't even have time to sleep. And I know I sound like a horrible person, but I don't have time for this. Now, those of you from functional families, you may be thinking, the two of you ended your relationship over stuff you couldn't give away at a garage sale? Yes, we did, because we're dysfunctional. All right. So I put all my sister energy into work. The girlfriend weekends, the slumber parties, the cruises. Things you would do with your real sister if your real sister didn't steal your stuff. But I never stopped thinking about her. I missed those golden years under the covers holding hands and talking. So when she texted me that day at Ed's, I realized I want my sister back in my life. Now, many reconciliations fail because when painful memories get stirred up, no one's willing to take the hit for the original split. 40% of the time, the one who left leaves again. So we start small, on a scenic mountain hike. Both of us are on eggshells, we don't want to blow it by saying the wrong thing, but frankly, we don't know what the right thing is to say because we don't know each other anymore. Our friends, our careers, our values, we are just so different. And then we start talking about feminism, work-life balance, lean in. And we discover that we both believe part of being a feminist means that someone needs to manage the home at a high level. For Leslie, it's her amazing husband, my brother-in-law. He's a full-time dad. In my family, it's me. It turns out we share the same family values. We just play different roles. I had no idea we thought so much alike. Well, then we see this new movie, Frozen, which I discover is about a big sister who tries to kill the little sister, then abandons her. Then, while the little sister risks her life to save the big sister's life, the big sister tries to kill the little sister again. And I'm the big sister. I love that movie. <laughs> so after the movie, we drive back to Colleen's and talk into the night until we slip in the same bed, head to toe, like we did when we were little girls holding hands till we fell asleep. It's the most beautiful memory I have of our childhood, sharing a bed with my little sister. And suddenly, I'm living it again as an adult. So, the experiment's going pretty well. No more fights about wall hangings. We, I can call her from my car, finally. We are slowly letting it go. But you know what? We let a lot of time go by. Who is this woman, anyway? Well, I'm at her house for dinner one night with her two beautiful daughters, my nieces. And at the end of the meal, Colleen says, let's hold hands. 
And then she pulls out a book of positive affirmations, and she reads a passage from this book. And when she's done, she says, girls, why don't you run off to your room and write a special entry in your journal? And the kids listened to her, and they went to their room, and they wrote in their journal. <laughs> and I'm thinking, why can't I get my kid to do that? I mean, normally I'm good and cool with my parenting style. Truly, I am. Until I see my sister in action, and she blows my mind. She's an amazing mother. And then I see my sister in action another night, giving a talk about what she's been up to these last 20 years, which apparently is a lot. Yes, she's my sister, but we don't really know each other. And my daughters are there, and her husband, and her son. And I'm expecting to see her train wreck of a life, because there's no way anyone can balance all this. And someone can. And that someone is my sister. And suddenly, I get it. So it's been a journey of discovery and transformation for both of us, both in how we see each other and how we see ourselves. And not long ago, in a restaurant in San Francisco, I actually found myself asking a total stranger, I did this, have you ever been in a dysfunctional relationship with someone when it dawns on you that maybe you're the problem? I said, maybe, don't get excited. <laughs> and I find myself asking my sister, how are you today? before saying, can we really talk about what happened with the wall hangings? I mean, I'm just asking. I mean, so really, this is an experiment, like I said, and the experiment may fail. Letting go of old patterns is hard work. It's very tempting to keep doing what you're doing and neglecting the challenging relationships in your life. I spent 20 years building a global sisterhood with Bare Minerals, connecting with all kinds of women all over the world, and not connecting with my own sister. And I've spent the last 15 years and counting, raising two daughters, two sisters, the same age difference apart that my sister and I are, teaching them to love each other, to forgive each other, to value family above all else, and not doing this myself. And then it hits you, watching your daughters, looking at your daughters, blowing out birthday candles at yet another party without their aunt. Or looking at your father-in-law, lying on his deathbed holding, deathbed holding your hand. Just like those people I used to read about when I was a young girl and still read about today in the obituaries. Stories with beginnings, middles, and ends. Stories that are sometimes cautionary tales, like Ann Landers and Dear Abby, probably the most famous advice columnists of the 20th century, and twin sisters who died estranged unable to take their own advice. You know, not the story I want someone telling about us. So we're trying to change our story, using the tools we've used to succeed in our working lives. I'm giving my time. And I'm giving up judgment. Okay, I'm trying to give up judgment. Whatever. <laughs> in other words, we're both being present. And so for the first time in 20 years, when I ask myself, what's missing? What do I need to add back into my life to feel more whole? What's out of balance? I can say for the first time, what's not missing is my little sister. And as a big sister, I feel whole, and that that part of my life is back in balance for today. And going forward, my year's resolution is going to be to ask that question every day instead of every year, much less 20 years, especially when what's missing may only be 45 minutes away over the bridge. And as we say in Sunday school, Amen to that. Aww. <laughs> you did it.